Okay, hello. Welcome back. Please take your seats. As always, I'll start with questions from last time. Yes. I have a couple of questions. Yes. I'm going to ask them to repeat your question now. We have seen how the slightly increased French works with adoption of the scheme. Yes. Adoption power, adoption market, and you take the adoption. I would like to know what happens if the true violent and the likelihood are two completely different classes. For example, I have a uniform trial on an interval, but I have adoption likelihood. For example, after, I mean, does it happen that after some updates, the procedure tends to gaussian starting from a uniform? Or, I mean, is it possible for the file to actually change shape? Yes, it is. It is. So the special case where the shape, the um, family, or yeah, the family of distribution does not change is called conjugate prior. So when the posterior is like the prior, then you've got a conjugate prior. And um, there are whole long tables of what likelihood distributions take what conjugate priors. So for a Gaussian likelihood, a Gaussian prior is conjugate. For a Bernoulli likelihood, a beta prior is conjugate, and so on. So um, uh, these um, tables are widespread. You can uh, look them up on Wikipedia. But as a side remark, I have to say that these conjugate priors are often not unique. You get a range of choices of conjugate priors you can uh, choose, and this can have consequences. So um, your update equations may look much more straightforward, much better interpretable, depending on what conjugate prior you choose. And the other question was about the uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise, it's possible. My question is, is there a way to understand from the value of the full of life how, I mean, is there a quantitative way to quantify how much the distribution of it? I mean, if I calculate the full of life diversion for the distribution, mm -hmm. I get the same for the truth. Mm -hmm. I say that this is much, a lot, this is a lot or little. Then I, can I infer from the number that I get the two distributions are actually a lot like? Um, basically, I would say no, but it's a question I've never asked myself. So I've never gone and uh, started interpreting the, the actual numbers I get. Um, yes, so relatively, you can. You, yeah. in, in absolute value, say. Yes. No way Here we have a suggestion. Yes, of course, but I mean, maybe I But the question is, would one mean anything? Is one sort of a... Because there is no after value What does a callback model divergence of one mean? Is there... Well, why compare it to one and not to two or to pi or two? Yes, yeah. So I would say that uh, when when we are much bigger than one, we are very different, and when we are much smaller than one, we are very different. 
I mean, that's, yeah, it's a very important Well, thing. yes, yeah. Uh, you would have to um, face such a, a scale on um, a distribution of distributions. So, uh, you know, you, you would have to um, look at um, what values in KL divergences are very common and sort of where you are in the kind of distribution you want to look at. So the answer is um, basically perhaps somebody can, I cannot. Yeah. Further questions? Good. Then the topic for today is to go into variational Laplace in detail. So there will be um, basically four parts to this. The first will be a little rehash of the um, basic concepts on the blackboard. Then we shall look at um, the free energy bound, bound on the log model evidence again. And then we'll go into the thick of it by looking at um, the variational optimization of the free energy under the mean field approximation. I don't know whether we'll finish this today, and otherwise we shall continue on um, Thursday when you will get a big dose of me, um, a four-hour marathon from nine to one. Um, so at least then we should get um, through all of this. Uh, we will do this on the blackboard, so I hope those who were longing for the blackboard um, will be happy with this. So, um, first part, this is basically a rehash of the basic concepts. So, what we're dealing with is always a generative model. P of y and theta given m. This is the model. And it is also the joint distribution of y and theta according to the product rule of probability theory you can take this apart into the conditional probability of y given theta and all, everything is always conditioned on a particular model and the marginal probability theta. Now these two things have names. What are the names of these things? What's the name of the first one? Likelihood, yes, likelihood. First one is the likelihood. And the second one is the prior. Perfect. Now, the thetas we have are our states and parameters. So state, the distinction between states and parameters becomes important when we look at time series where we infer on hidden states of the environment, as I already briefly mentioned, states change with time. So from one time to the next, the states are going to be different, but parameters are constant. For the purpose of what we're doing today, this distinction does not matter. We just take this together in one big set theta. And M is our model. Whereas
as Y. Those are our observations. Data measurements. So these are the basic quantities involved. Yes. I cannot. Okay, on the, I should write, where should I write? Ah, not below the line here. Okay, okay. So I shall redraw this line. That's what the line was for. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, what I wrote here is observations, data, measurements, just three words belong to this arrow. These are the basic quantities we're dealing with. And then we have Bayes' theorem. This is the foundation of everything. Posterior, which is the conditional distribution of theta on the observations y in the model n, is simply the inverse of the likelihood times the prior divided by the model evidence. So, posterior, this is new. We didn't have this on the left side. And this is the model evidence. Or marginal likelihood. It's also sometimes called the marginal likelihood. Not to be confused with the likelihood proper up here. And now let's look how we got this. What is this? This is again the product rule that gives you this. If you multiply this to the other side, then you simply see the product rule of probability theory. But if we apply the sum rule, we know how to get this. So the model evidence is the integral over theta of the term up here. So this is for a specific theta. And if we just integrate over all thetas in this expression, we get the denominator here. So we take the likelihood times the prior. We put a prime on theta because it's our integration variable. And we integrate it out. So this is the model evidence. And by the product rule here, you can see that this is a simple marginalization over theta. So these are the basic concepts that we're going to deal with. So it's already time to wipe this part here out. Two. The free energy 
found on the log model evidence. So, the ingredients we're going to um, use is an arbitrary density. This is the Q of theta that you saw in the slides. We're going to write it like this. This is Q of theta. And then this is a semicolon, and then this is a lambda. And this means Q of theta parameterized by lambda. Just imagine the simple case again with the Gaussian, where Q of theta is, for instance, for example, taken to be Gaussian, and then lambda are the two sufficient statistics, mu and sigma, mean and variance, that parameterize our Gaussian. So this is a arbitrary density. Parameterized by lambda. For example, Q, yes? In this case, yes, that's an assumption we're going to make that um, this, um, no, in general, no, in general, no, in the most general case, no. But we're going to use, we're going to want to use this because we want to make assumptions about our Q so that we can control it. So we are going to, as I said in, in very general here, we are going to wiggle around our Q of theta in order to reduce this KL divergence between the Q and the true posterior, because that gets us closer to the true posterior and the variational energy closer to the true free energy. Variational free energy, I should say. So, for instance, Q Gaussian. with lambda equals mu and sigma. So this is one of the ingredients that we're going to use. And a model. Plus a model as before. So, I, I'll write it again. These are the ingredients we're going to use. No, M is basically um, the only model we're going to deal with here. So we're going to choose one M. That's going to be our model M. We choose a model M and a Q of theta parameterized by lambda. P 
of y beta. This is the model evidence. This here. Yes. Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. I understand what you mean. Yes. So, um, another way to write this. In, in some sense, I'm going to ask you to live with this degeneracy. But another way to write this would be Pm of y and theta. And then your Pm would be the particular likelihood of y given theta without the m, and the particular prior on theta. So what I mean is I have a particular likelihood and a particular prior. And those are probability distributions and my way of saying these refer to a particular model M is simply to say conditional on me having the model M. Yes? So, theta is also a set of parameters we want to infer? Theta is the set of states and parameters we want to infer. So, we have no control over them. The lambda is what parameterizes our approximate posterior. Okay, I mean, I mean they are fixed and we will not include them. No, we will adjust them so that the goal is to, um, let me write this down, goal, adjust lambda such that q of theta parameterized by lambda is approximately sorry the posterior here. So we make observations y. We have our model m. Theta are the parameters we're inferring. And lambda is what we're shifting around. In order for this to be as like this as possible. That's what we're doing here. Yes, yes, we will go through examples. Um, many more blackboards um, will be filled with examples. Yes. Um, mu and sigma, mu and sigma are lambda here. Lambda is just generic, a placeholder for the set of um, sufficient statistics that our particular Q has. So we have two parameters. Yes, well, a one-dimensional Gaussian always has two sufficient statistics. Ah, okay. So they're separate. Theta is what we're trying to infer. This is what's what defines the world that we want to understand. Theta, in some sense, generates y. We observe y, we take y, and we infer back on theta. So it's this picture that we had in the slides. So um, we have 
basically the brain here. Let me try to, yeah, this is a brain here. Huh? And now this is the world outside. Uh, hmm. So let me, maybe this is uh, North America and then South America. Like this, yeah, maybe it's like this. Yeah. And then with Europe and Africa, it's more difficult. So this is the world. And now we have a forward model that tells us how the world, this is theta, generates y. So this is our model. Probability of seeing y given a particular theta. And then we also have a prime on theta. This is the observation we make. But now, what we're interested in is knowing what the world outside is like. And in order to do that, we need to perform Bayesian inference in order to get the posterior given the observations that we have. This is the inverse problem. This is what we're trying to solve. And this is the forward model. Um, the, the, the short answer is no, because theta is the reality out there. So this distribution over theta is a probability distribution, and this distribution is different from the prior distribution, but theta is theta is theta. Theta is the external reality. So, to go back to this example that we'll come back to again, if I'm out at sea and I'm measuring the angle between the lighthouse I'm seeing and north, theta is that angle. And there is one true angle. I'm trying to infer that. And before I make my observation, I have a certain belief about theta, and this is my prior. And after I make my observation, I have a new belief about theta. But theta is theta is theta. Slide number 21. In this example, yes. So this is a particular example. So this is generic, what you see now. And then I take particular values for the quantities here. I fill them in, and I get a Gaussian. But this is only, um, OK, I, I see you say, OK, theta is this theta is another thing here. What is theta here is lambda there. I may have to adjust that. So no, 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 no. It's a different it's a different one. It's a different one. Yes. Yeah. So I should be more consistent in the notation. So here. Um, here, 
though x is y, here, x is y, and um, the theta that we um, use to infer, so we have an added layer of complexity here. So theta here is the external reality that we're trying to infer. So this, there is a consistency, but there's an added level of complexity because now, in this whole scheme here, which is actually much simpler than the one we're looking at here, we don't have a Q. Yes, exactly. But now we're taking the exactly, exactly. So the external reality that we're trying to infer is these parameters in this setting. So conceptually, this theta and the theta here are the same. But we've added a level of complexity now. So we have sort of interposed this Q between theta and ourselves. So we are mediating with theta on the basis of lambda. So we're using an approximate posterior. We are describing theta by lambda. We're learning a description of our universe. And there, we're sort of directly inferring on the parameters of the distributions generating our data. There's an added layer of complexity. The added layer of complexity is that we are not directly inferring the um, posterior. So what we're doing here is we're solving Bayes' theorem doing this here directly. We're solving the inverse problem directly without ever going through an approximate posterior Q. What this will give us here is an approximate solution. And what this gives us is an exact solution. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we are parametrically describing reality using our Q here. So here, we're sort of um, directly going to the parameters generating our input. And here, we're using a description, a parametric description of that. And we're going to adjust that so that it comes close to this. So we're not going to directly find theta. We are going to find the best lambda to describe our theta. That's the, the added layer of complexity that we have. And we do this because that allows us to solve the problem which would otherwise be impossible to solve. So we are doing all of this because in all interesting cases, Bayes' theorem that you had here 10 minutes ago cannot be solved analytically. There is, in principle, no solution to, um, to that equation. So you, you cannot derive an analytic solution to it that you can write down. So we have to find a way around this. And the way around this is to, um, or our way here, there are several ways, but our way here um, to get around this is to use the free energy bound on the log model evidence, as the title says. That's what we're doing now. I hope this will become clear in the course of the lectures as we also do examples. So we will get to, um, well, um, 
a, a whole class of examples where we apply this strategy to determine um, what is going on outside and what the states and parameters of our systems are. Yes. You can just ask uh, so we can discuss it. Um, Yes, okay. So this is, yeah, the, the brain makes observations, has sensations. Yes. No, theta, theta is what um, I have. I can show you another slide that may be helpful here. Okay, okay, okay. This one here, I like this slide. Okay. Let me let me just update this to say Okay. This is our agent. This is our brain, or the robot we're building, or whatever. This is the world outside. There are two interfaces between these two separate little worlds, the outside world and the inside world. One interface is the sensory input, and the other interface is the action our agent takes on the world. So theta is basically out there. It's the state of the outside world. And the lambdas are what describes that. So keep this in mind, I'll, I'll leave it up. Okay, now we continue by introducing the mean field approximation. Um, we'll do this over here. Mean field approximation, originally from physics. Q of theta, and now for clarity, I'm going to stop writing this M. The M is always there, right? So let's forget about it. Q of theta. is the product over all the elements in a partition of index sets Q of theta j. So we have our theta. So this is um, all of our thetas are in here. And now we're going to partition them. Yes? J. J. So this is um, normal J and this is capital J. Little J, big J. Yeah, 
Can you? Well, how can we? Well, so there is um, in probability there is the sort of bad habit, which is at variance with all the rest of mathematics, that when I write p of x and I write p of y, this is not the same function. So it just means probability distribution on y and probability distribution on x. This is unfortunate, but it's ubiquitous in probability. Sorry, uh, yes? Yes, I know. So, of course, hardcore mathematicians um, cannot tolerate this. And um, they, they then write something like Fx on X on capital X, something like that. We're not going to do this because um, in much of the literature that we, we deal with in probability machine learning and so on, this is not done. So, um, you know, it, it's not just me who's doing this, and you'll have to get used to it. P just means probability distribution. And this distribution can be different from this. And these Qs are going to be different from each other. So, what counts in some sense is the variable inside. So the argument tells you what function this is. This is the distribution on x. This is the distribution on y. It's unfortunate, but it's a, a, a fact that's historically grown. So we're partitioning up our thetas into different groups of thetas. And so here we have little j equals 1, little j equals 2, little j equals 3, and so on. Yes, yes. It's a set of um, basically indices. Yeah of the whole um, set of states and parameters that we want to infer. And big J is an index set. And this is That's what we're doing. So we're going to do some notation. Theta without i. So this is a backslash. You know from uh, set theory you have a without B. Yeah. So that's, if you have A and B, or A minus B, yeah. But I'm not going to say minus I, I'm going to say without I. This is defined as the set of Theta j's without where j is not equal. It's all thetas in here except the ones that are in the ith subset. And then you'll be happy about this. We're just going to write QI as a shorthand for Q of theta I.
and q without i is going to be the product of all q of theta j with j unequal i. That's q without i. And in all of this, so for all of this, we have i and j elements of big J. So, the free energy This will be used as soon as we look at, have looked at the free energy functional. Uh, let me wipe this. The free energy functional. Functional is a function of a function. So, you know, not a function of a variable, but a function of a function. So, we are going to look at the free energy as a function of Q. And Q itself is a function, that's why it's called a function. So, we take the log model evidence and we write the log model evidence as the marginal integral of the joint Keep the given m d theta, and then we're going to do some algebra. We're going to keep the log outside here, but then inside the integral, we're going to do some very simple trick. We're going to multiply by q of theta parameterized by lambda and then we're going to divide by the same thing again so effectively we've done nothing we've done nothing huh? we've multiplied by q of theta given l and we've divided by it again so this equality holds. And now, we take the log inside. We take the log in here. That's what we're doing. And that's why we get this inequality. This is called Jensen's inequality. It's itself easy to prove. You can look it up on Wikipedia. There's a proof on Wikipedia. Log of 
of the join divided by the Q of theta parameterized by lambda. And integrated over theta. And then this thing continues. Over here, we take this apart simply again using the rules of logarithms. So we now have two integrals g of theta parameterized by lambda times the numerator here. That's the log joint. Minus Q of theta parameterized by lambda times the log of the same quantity theta parameterized by lambda d theta. And this is how the internal energy is defined, because this is the expectation under Q. That's what this notation means. There's the expectation under Q. And this is, again, a functional. And I'm going to write functionals with square brackets of the log joint. plus the entropy, which is also a function, a functional, sorry. <coughs> you see this is a function of a function. So I can just write Q here. And this, in turn, defines our free energy functional. So, to be consistent with the slides, and we call it A, this is A, and this will be a function now of lambda, of the observations, and of whatever we put into our model, so our prior and our likelihood. So, M here is just a placeholder for definition of prior and likelihood. This is what the free energy, the variational free energy, is a function of. This is the variational free energy. This is the expected log joint the physical analogy to it is the internal energy we saw that in the slides and this is the entry Be exact, this is the expected long joint, this is the negative internal energy, and here in this notation we need a minus sign here to get the variational free energy here. So, because energies are always negative log probabilities, energies correspond to negative log probabilities.
So, we want to have our optimal L, our optimal lambda, and I will write down this goal that we have, yes? Why is there no theta here? Because Q is parameterized by lambda. So if you have your Q, you have your distribution on the theta. But this is not a function of theta. It is a function of lambda. If you, you, if you look at this purely as a function, so you don't, um, in, the, in this here, you have a distribution on theta, but it is parameterized by lambda. So what you put into the function q here is, um, is the lambda. Imagine a Gaussian again. So in order to define your Gaussian, you give it a mean and a variance. And the variable whose distribution is described by that Gaussian is not what you put in. So the theta is what this Gaussian describes, but what you, it is a function of the, um, of the mean and the variance you put in. So it only depends on this here. So what we want is basically our lambda star, which is the arc min of the variational free energy. Let's, sorry about this, I shouldn't have done it like this. Let's call this F. And then this is the negative variational free energy. And to be consistent with the slides, this is minus AV. So this is the quantity you have in all the slides. This is F and this is AV. So we want the lambda that minimizes our variational free energy. So, argument of AV, which is a function of lambda, y, and n, like this. This is what we want. So we want the optimal lambda, the one that makes our Q as similar as possible to the true posterior. Yes? It's not just the mean. So it's the optimal mean and the optimal um, variance of the Gaussian that describes um, theta. So it is your posterior belief, because some uncertainty about theta will remain. So you will still have a variance in your belief. 
So under Bayes' theorem, if you could solve it exactly, you would have a posterior distribution with a certain mean and variance. The exact distribution may not be a Gaussian. So it may be any kind of distribution, but it will be a distribution. So if you approximate that distribution using a Gaussian, you will have a certain mean and a certain variance. And that will be the mean star and the variance star, which are, uh, for which lambda star is a short hand. So let's just boldly move on. So what we do is we have a constraint on our cues. And that is that all of the cues have to be probability distribution. The QI has to be probability distributions. And that means, in mathematical terms, the integral over each of the QIs have to be one. for all i's. So, we want to minimize AV under this constraint. We have to observe this constraint. We're going to wiggle around with all of our cues. We're going to change the lambdas parameterizing our cues in order to minimize AD. What is the way to do that from your calculus classes? If you minimize something under a certain constraint, what do you do? What do you employ? Exactly. So we're going to solve this using Lagrange multipliers. So, we introduce Lagrange multipliers. So we're going to use f tilde, the functional f tilde, which is defined as, or yeah, like the functional we had before, plus. All of these Lagrange multipliers, lambda j, these are the multipliers here. And inside we have this constraint that q of theta j d theta j minus 1 b equal to 0. 
that's how you use Lagrange multiplier. You solve the constraint for zero, and you multiply it and add it to the functional you want to minimize. And now, we do the following. We take this apart, or we, we fill in the definitions. So it's integral. The whole Q of theta, this is now our whole Q of theta, not divided up into the theta i's. And then the log probability of the joint. minus the entropy, also the whole Q of theta, log the whole Q of theta, plus our Lagrange multiplier terms, lambda j, and in here, again, the Q of theta j d theta j minus 1. I'll clean this up here. And now we're going to separate this out into different integrals. So we're going to separate out one of the QIs. So we're going to say this is the integral over Q theta I times the integral over Q theta without i. Log joint. D theta without i. D theta i. So this is exactly the same as here, but now we've taken this apart. So we have an inner integral Overall, the theta j's, where j is not i, and then an outer integral over q of theta i. It's still the same. And we do the exact same with this term here, too. So q of theta i, integral uh, q of theta without i, and log q of, and then this is the log that applies to both of them, q theta not i times q theta i, and this is the end of the log, so all of this is in the argument of the log, d theta not i d theta i. Plus, and now here, it's easy to separate them, lambda i times the integral simply over q of theta i, d theta i minus 1, plus a sum over all the j's that are not i. So I'm simply going to write not i here. This is what we're summing over. And um, this is the integral of q theta not i d 
D beta not I minus one like this. And now we're going to write this as the functional f tilde of two arguments. And the first of them is going to be qi, and the second argument is going to be q not i. And now, we're going to take the functional, yes? I was waiting for somebody to spot this, you're right. We don't need the sum, we don't need the sum. So, um, so actually, yeah. Let's be, let's be totally anal and let's do it like this. I think then it's the clearest possible. Let's put in indices J here and let's explicitly write J not equal I like this. Do you agree? This is an I, sorry. Ah. So here, we're summing over all of the lambda j's. It should be. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't see that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So now we are going to take the functional derivative of this with respect to QI. Who in here is not familiar with variational calculus? Everybody familiar with variational calculus? So you're fine with taking the functional derivative. So it's basically like taking the derivative with respect to a variable. If you have a function, you take, and it has um, it is a function of x and y, you can take the derivative, the partial derivative, um, with respect to x, or you can take the partial derivative with respect to y. Now, here we're dealing with functionals, functions of functions. And in exactly the same way, we can now take the functional derivative here with respect to qi. So this f tilde has a certain value. And we want to find out whether we can find a minimum with respect to QI. And this minimum will have as a necessary condition that when we vary QI at the point of this minimum, we will have a derivative of zero. So what we're going to do is we take the functional derivative with respect to qi and set that to zero and solve the whole thing for um, this optimal q, which will be parameterized by lambda. And then we have found the optimal qi with respect to our free energy and can use this in actual applications to models. So, 
we shall, I will at first give you the definition of the functional derivative again, and then we shall actually start doing the functional derivative. We'll probably finish with it um, tomorrow, but we shall at least start now. <laughs> Take the functional derivative of F tilde with respect to Ui. So, this is the derivative with respect to a variable epsilon. Evaluated where epsilon is zero of F tilde, which is a functional of Q I plus epsilon times phi I, where phi I is a test function. And the second argument, which we're not worrying about at this stage, is Q without I. This is the definition of the functional derivative. We're just using this definition here. As um, basically as badly behaved as allowable. So it has to vanish at the ends, basically. So it is in uh, a thing called Schwartz space, um, and it, um, which means it cannot grow to infinity at the ends, basically. Um, it certainly has to be continuous, and um, it has to be differentiable. I don't know how many how many times, yeah, okay. but I can yeah. So it has to be reasonably well behaved, but we don't want to be too restrictive either. So. You can find pathological phi's where this doesn't work anymore. So um, basically, the rest is algebra. But it's going to be um, a little bit of algebra before we get our final result. So we're going to take the derivative respect to epsilon evaluated at epsilon equals zero. And we're just going to um, put in, I'm going to give you the first step. And then basically, I will leave out a few steps and will let you fill in this rest during a tutorial. So basically, when are your tutorials due or set? Or um, how are they organized? When can I make you or let you do uh, fill in the gaps in the whole derivation? Is there going to, is there time allotted for that? Or do we do it all here? All here, you're saying all here. 
You don't want homework? Okay, um, I, will, I will not do every little step, but um, I'm happy to take questions about um, the missing steps that may still be there. So, um, times oops, the second integral here, because, you know, a mu much of the whole thing is copying from a bob. Log joint, all right, theta given m, and d theta not i, d theta i. And this is then minus um, the derivative with respect to epsilon and why is this here? Okay, this is a little algebraic trick. I'm going to have to give you this, otherwise you may get stuck. So we subtract this here, plus epsilon phi um, theta y, theta i, and q of theta given i log Q of theta i plus epsilon phi theta i Q of not i and then close the parenthesis and add d theta not y d theta i. And then we continue. No. We add, we need two more terms here. Plus, plus. Lambda i times oops, q theta i plus epsilon phi of theta i d theta i minus one. Plus D. again derivative with respect to epsilon evaluated at epsilon zero and then we do the sum again this is the J unequal I sum times lambda J and Q um, theta um, J D theta J minus one. Okay. So This is the energy term, then um, entropy term, and then the same for the, um, or basically, yeah. So the four terms are energy and entropy for theta i and theta not i. That gives you four terms. Now, 
we take out the phi i's. That's the next step we do. We take them out before the integral. So I'm going to wipe the first line. I hope everybody's finished with copying here. Everybody finished with copying? No, 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 no. Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. So I'm going to slow down a bit. Okay, we're just going to do the next step, and there is going to be a radical simplification already now, because we're going, we're going to take all of these derivatives now. So, after we take the derivative in the first term, all that we're left with is phi of theta i. Sorry, the integral over phi of theta i, I should get the integral, q of theta not i, log joint, d theta not i, d theta i. So that's all that's remained of our first term. Second term, integral over phi theta i times integral over q of theta not i log these two q's multiplied together. Q of theta i times Q of theta not i. D theta not i, D theta i. That's our second term. Third term. That's going to look a bit more complicated. Q of theta i Q of theta not i and now a big fraction of phi theta i Q of theta without i and q of theta i divided by q of theta not i. So you see we're doing uh, our old trick again. We're multiplying or yeah we're just multiplying by one here. D Theta not i, d theta i. Plus our last term, which is v 
very nicely simple. Okay, and from here it's uphill. In the third term, is it a? Let me first check whether I did everything correctly. Yes. Now your question is about which exactly? The third, the whole third term. Um, so let me check. No, um, it was somewhat misleading to relate the previous four terms directly to these four terms, because if you look at the previous four terms we had, then the last of them does not contain epsilon. So if you take the derivative to that, it falls away. Here. And this one. Exactly, yes. Okay. You may be right. Yes, you were absolutely right. Thank you for spotting this. Yes. This one. Yes. Shouldn't we have phi in both terms? So here and here. Or on the right, what do you mean? Yes. Yes. This cancel out, yes. So we're going to need this in the next step. Yes. Um, because um, we want to. Um, end up with interpretable terms like entropy and um, a partition function so that um, everything will be so everything will be very very simple so i will give you maybe in the last few minutes a preview a sneak peek at the end result so just to see you that uh, the, just to show you <laughs> that the um, effort will be worth it. We will end up with a Q of theta i. This will be our optimal Q of theta i. Um, that is 1 over z i. This is just a normalization constant. It's the exponential of what we're going to call the variational energy capital I of theta I and this term I of theta I will turn out to be simply the expectation I'm going to use angle brackets for that of the log joint
on the Q not I. So all we need to do to find our optimal Q is this. We take the log joint. This is simply our model. This is our likelihood and our prior. And we take the expectation of this. So basically, we integrate over all the thetas that are not, all the theta j's that are where j is not i, so that these remain. We take the expectation with respect to that. And this gives us a function which is only a function of theta i, because all the other thetas have been integrated out. Only a function of theta i. And we exponentiate that function, and this is our q. Finish. So exceedingly simple. All that we still need to do is normalize it, but that's easy. So all you need to do to find your optimal Q here in this mean field approximation is take your log joint, take the expectation of your log joint with respect to all of the Qs that are not I, exponentiate this and you've got your Q. Then you multiply all of your Qs together and you've got the whole Q the whole approximate posterior, which is going to be optimal um, under your assumptions about the parametric form of Q. We're going to finish these um, algebraic steps uh, on Thursday, and then we will look at the Laplace approximation. So in the remaining three minutes or so. Any questions right now? I suggest you digest this at home. You find any more um, sign errors I could have made? I hope there aren't any more. And then we'll complete this on Thursday. If there aren't any immediate questions, thanks for bearing with me. See you. Oh, yes, I have this. Uh, you can have this written down at some point. But, yeah. Do you have any interpretation for this? A direct interpretation. Um, we call this the variational energy because it's. This is the log joint. So, this is the. The physical analogon to this is the um, internal energy. So it's the internal energy.